Hello everybody. Today's date is Sunday, February 25th, um, 2024. Time right now as I'm recording this starting um, is 8.54 p.m. at night. Um, sorry for uploading this so late in the night. I was kind of just doing some communal things around the house, have a little bit more of a lax day today, but I appreciate you being here with me for today's Daily Devotional, a series where I keep myself responsible for diving into God's Word and hold myself accountable for doing it by uploading these. So if you're here with me, going through all of that and reading it with me, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Today's devotional is actually one that is pretty important to me, um, one that I bring up in, I feel like, every other devotional video that I do. Um, and it's explicitly and almost exclusively about Jesus's proscriptions for us amongst the in entirety of the world. Um, there's two really big ones that's actually pointed out in a, a, a few of the synoptics. Uh, I know it has it in Luke and I know it has it in Matthew. But today we're going to be diving into Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 12 verses 28 through 31. So we're going to be going through a whole series of this. And of course, we're going to be diving in and trying to explain all of it in a godly and Christ-like fashion. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Again, this is Mark 12, 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And again, that is Mark 12, 28 through 31. So as I said right at the top of this, um, this particular set of commandments isn't just exclusive to Mark. I know it appears in Luke, and I know for sure that it appears in Matthew. And there's actually uh, maybe even a few Old Testament references to this as well, but I'm not going to dive into that. But I know for sure it happens in um, Matthew, Mark, um, and uh, Luke, of course. This one is particularly unique because it involves the a thing called the Shema, um, and all of that is in, involved in this particular set of verses. At least this particular description of these verses that are happening, of course, being described by Mark in this particular passage. The whole idea behind this, it's pretty straightforward. The King James Version, I, I've said this before, is pretty known for having a little bit of obtuse language, being a little, uh, dare I say, uh, hard to understand. But it, I think it's pretty straightforward here. It is two commandments that Jesus is describing or proscribing rather to somebody who is asking him what the greatest commandments are. And he says it pretty directly. Just in general, there's not really a lot of room for misinterpretation or any sort of wiggle room with this. It's just love the Lord with all thy heart and love your neighbor as you would love myself. And then Jesus ties this pretty succinctly with there is none other commandment greater than these. That's pretty bar none, in my opinion. And again, this is this one's pretty unique as it is describing this with the Shema involved. I have said this in previous devotionals too, but what's interesting is that I can finally dive in to a subject like this without it having make no sense. So the word love here is being used in a way that, that is almost exclusive in and of itself. Let me explain what I mean. So in any sort of 
field of love in general, there are three types of it. There is what is called a uh, eros, which is like the the passionate, the 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 lustful, the romantic. That is like the the kind of love where you have between like a husband and wife or a couple or whoever it is, and they're wanting to love each other. That kind of love. Jesus obviously is not describing this particular set of love. Of course, there's the philos, which is like a f um uh, uh like a familial or like a friendly kind of love. Um. Like a platonic kind of love, which like a somebody that you would care about as your family, um, that you would love as your family, or as a really, really good friend. Um, I've talked about this before, but I have a family that I have absorbed, and they are part of my family. If I were to have children and get married and things, they would be like the uncles and the aunts. Even though they're not like my blood brothers or sisters or anything, that's what they would be to my children. They would be my uncles, or they would be the, the uncles and the aunts. That, that's what that would be. The love that is being described here, though, is a a different set a, besides phylos and eros. It is actually agape love. There's a lot of kind of wishy-washiness that you could get into with the word agape, but fundamentally what this is is a sacrificial, unconditional amount or sanctifying love. Regardless of what happens, regardless of who they are, regardless of if you ate breakfast that morning, the agape love is ultimately sacrificial and unconditional, unbeknownst to anything before, during, or after whatever is going to happen. What, it, what Jesus is describing here is that agape love. Full stop. It's not very hard to understand. Um, the love your neighbor... Of course, it's very popular. It's, again, not just showing up in this. It actually shows up in quite a few places in the Old and the New Testament. But what it's describing here is something particularly special because Jesus literally says there are no two commandments greater than loving God with all of your heart, mind, and soul and loving your neighbor with the agape love, unconditional sacrificial, completely unbeknownst and irregardless of anything that happens before, during, or after. That kind of love. The kind of love where you would actively go out of your way to do something for somebody, even if you disagree with them. Even if you had a previously bad interaction. Even if you had an argument. Even if they did something to you that you may not have really liked. Maybe they insulted you. Or maybe they did something bad to you or something. I have no clue. But that's what this agape love is. And Jesus, I mean, it's in the synoptic docils. Even in extra biblical texts, the Apocrypha, even letters amongst people of the biblical times about meeting Jesus. Just talked about how much he exuded this sacramental, this sacrificial kind of love towards just regular lay peoples, peoples that were just going about their life, not really having to care about anything. And he would go out and do good things unto these peoples. He would clean them, feed them, you know, pray with them, uh, pastor to them. He would be very pastoral to them. And it was completely, again, unbeknownst of anything that happened before, during, or after any of it, any of it. And the whole point is that's the end-all, be-all of it. There's not any two ways about it. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor with that agape love as you would love yourself. If you were struggling and having a hard time, how would you want somebody to come to you and, and, and talk to you out of your struggle or out of your maybe spiritual battle you're having or maybe out of your financial troubles too? How would you want someone to be compassionate and talk to you out of that. Um, I know I've talked to death about this love thing, not just in this devotional, but in previous ones. I had a, a, a short series on Matthew a few weeks ago. And, um, and I mean, because it's important. If we are to 
of course, we can't be explicitly Jesus. I, we can't be explicitly anybody else besides ourselves anyway. But if we are to act in that very Jesus, that very Christly way, the agape love is, is very important. There, there are pinnacles to this and kind of foundational principles under the agape love. In that verse, it even says um, that they were, they were reasoning together. Um, that is one kind of foundational principle of that agape love. You wouldn't just, hey, I'm struggling financially. Oh, okay, I'm just going to give you a couple squirrels. Huh? That's not reasonable, of course. That's a very extreme example. I don't think any person would actually end up doing that. But the, the point still stands. You would be reasonable with them. You would reason with them. Isaiah um, has a, a, a whole passage about how God calls on Isaiah to reason with him. Because that's what they did. That's a, a lot of what the kind of influential thinking of the time was inspired by, by Greek peoples. A lot of... Uh, Aristotelian and Platonic and uh, and Socratilian and Socratilian, uh, Socratic rather, <laughs> a, a lot of that was involved in that kind of thinking, and they would talk and they would reason together on under kind of an umbrella of theology. That's one foundation. Another foundation is just I brought this up a little earlier, just the compassionate part. You wouldn't want to bombard somebody with just everything they're doing wrong. We're all sinful. We all have our fallings out and we are all doing the which ways of things and just kind of trying to trudge through it. Completely understandable. Every person ever understands this. But the whole point is that we're not meant to bombard each other with that kind of rhetoric or with that kind of thinking. If I were to come to you Hey, I'm struggling spiritually. Oh, it's because you was sinned and last week you kind of lied to this person. No, that's not what you're supposed to be compassionate about. You're supposed to be compassionate in that you're supposed to listen. You were supposed to grapple with what they're trying to tell you and understand it. They're not having a spiritual struggle just so you can go to them and lecture to them about what they're doing wrong. They're coming to you with that spiritual struggle, with that financial struggle, with that hard time, whatever it is, because they trust you with that compassion. And the, and the third and final point, and this I think is the, is the most important one, is that if we center all of this on, I mean, so we have reason, compassion, and if we center it all on a spiritual, on a kind of aristocratic kind of just all-encompassing feeling of community, then there's nothing stopping us from redirecting where we're at towards Christ. You gotta be reasonable, you gotta be compassionate, and you gotta be wholly fulfilled in that this person can be helped. That this person can be changed for the better. That this person has that. There is a hopefulness. So, to kind of redirect this towards me, I told a story a couple weeks ago about how for a very long time I, I hated my mom. I, I truly did. I, I stand by all of what I said during that period. I, I take it. I regret it now. I, I can't do anything about it. But during that period, I said a lot of very hateful things to my mom. Um, things that she couldn't answer for. Um, and make no mistake, what my mom did was very awful and dreadful and shouldn't be done to me or anybody else ever. But I spent a lot of my younger years hating my mom and blaming her for a lot of the fallouts I was having, whether it be socially or if it was financially or just mentally. And as I've come to pass in my adult life, I have come to regret that pretty heavily. And while I don't think this in my heart, I don't think she may necessarily be in heaven. I have no clue, truly. So if during that period where I was hating my mom and we weren't talking and I was just insulting her and being mean, if she really did turn to God and, and, and you know, 
was wrapped up in the grace and, and mercy of, of Christ, then by all means, she is in heaven. And I, I hope to be there and talk to her and ask her questions and things and tell her that I have forgiven her for what she has done. That's a little maybe selfish and self-centered, um, but that is a, a thing that I am hopeful for. I am hopeful for that to happen for somebody like my mom. In the same way, I am hopeful for something like that for me, for you, my girlfriend, uh, my family. I don't proselytize or chastise against them. I operate as I normally would with compassion, with reason, and aristocratic spirituality about myself. And I, and I describe generally good things and I try to talk to them and be communal with them in a generally reasonable and compassionate fashion. I don't suck at them over the head with the Bible as soon as they start saying whatever it is about everything else. That's not what we were meant to do, okay? James makes that very clear. So, all in all, the agape love is extremely important and fundamental with how we operate amongst the entirety of the world. Everywhere. Not just here on YouTube, not just in your house, everywhere, with those three foundational pillars stacking up, holding it up, with the agape love right on top, and then to spread amongst. And you can see this. I mean, it says, I mean, it's not hard. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You wouldn't want someone to come to you unreasonable and uncompassionate, do you? Or is that is that uncompassionate, discompassionate? Not compassionate, would you? You wouldn't want someone to come to you from an anti-aristocratic kind of mean-spirited way, would you? No, of course not. Duh. <laughs> and that's it. That's just what it is. To tie this into something a little bit more biblical, I suppose, we all understand we have, we have no other choice but to work our way through sin. We just don't have any other choice. We have to grapple and, and come to grips with it. We have to pray on it. We got to work our way through it however we know how, whether that's be just kind of doing it in the moment and then praying to God and coming to God and reading the Bible afterwards. Maybe in the moment you are actively seeking God, trying to help you through that sin. We are not sinless. Again, we have no other choice. We don't have any other operational idea to not go through it. We have to. Just by nature. I mean, it goes back to Adam and Eve. Once they did the thing, we had no other choice. We, we, we inherited the consequences of that that have spread amongst the world. And that's just the end of it. We, ha we have to. There's just no other choice. Now, here it is. Jesus understands this. He completely gets it. He is sinless in, 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 as all get out. He, doesn't, he didn't make any mistakes, really. Or at all. Not really. He didn't make any mistakes at all, actually. But even so, he understands that we have to operate through it. We have to. It's why he came directly to us. You could look at this. You could even kind of twist this. Not twist it. You can kind of look at it from like a kind of a reflective, reformed angle. Where Jesus knew exactly what sins we would operate through. And he came to those and pastored to those people because he already knew. You could come at this from like an Episcopalian angle. I mean, the Reformed is kind of where I center myself. I think the sovereignty of God is the whole... You know, predestination, I think, is pretty watertight theologically. I don't think you can really wiggle your way out of it. But even so, there's a, a bunch of different angles. You could do like a, you could do like a, an, uh, an Anglican view if you tried uh, Lutheran even. But there's a lot of different ways. The predestination part is very important. But anyway, 
Either way, he came to those that were already active in sin and pastored to them because he knew they would have to work through it. He knew that they would have to come to him to work through it. Because he knew that we didn't have any other choice. We don't have the capacity not to sin. It's just not, it's not a choice that we have. It's all over the entire world. It's going to happen regardless. We have to work through it. Jesus knew that it wasn't something that's going to be punished outright, but it is a an object to be corrected, a, a behavior to be put in a graceful direction. There's the meme where it's like the two roads. Do you take the narrow or do you take the wide or whatever? And he knew that the road to that is narrow. And so he guided them, pushed them in that direction. Sacrificially, unbeknownst of any decision before, during, or after that pastoring, after his sermons, anywhere, anywhere, and he had that agape love gripped in him. Because he knew. He already did. His purpose there. As soon as he had some sort of functioning conscious experience. Because, you know, he was an infant baby. They can't talk or anything. But as soon as he was an adult and was able to be aware of his conscious experience and his purpose on earth. He knew exactly what his plan should be and how he would operate through it. And the foundation of these love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as you would love yourself is that agape love. Reason, compassion, and aristocratic spirituality. One where people can commune and come together and be amongst him. There are truly some very hateful, gross, bigoted people in this world. You can, maybe not necessarily in, in real life all the time that you see them, but if you go on the internet anywhere, people are just making up some gross stuff. Just saying mean things, just being mean-spirited. If you're missing any of those three pillars, if you're missing any of them, then you're not fulfilling that agape love, that sacrificial, that completely unconditional love. You are not fulfilling that command. Bar none. And that's the end. We are to be in this world, not of it, Stop yourself. We're not to be of the world. We're not made by like money. We're not made by the things that we have. We're not made by whatever thing is the greatest thing on the world or whatever. We are in the world. There are cool things in the world. There's cool art, cool buildings, cool books, cool video games. Great. We're not made by those things. But we are in this world. We are made to prosper amongst it, spread the gospel, commune with people, and share that unconditional Christ love amongst the people. Jesus did every day. And that had reason, compassion, and aristocratic spirituality every day. I think about these, not this particular set, I think about the ones in Matthew a little more, but I think about this like whole dialogue in any of the Synoptic Gospels. I think about this a lot. I really do. It 
because, and and I'll I'll wrap up here. This has gone on for way too long at this point, but it's funnily enough, it's not even my longest one, but it's it's still pretty long anyway. <laughs> so here it is. Here's like the the kind of the bow on this <laughs> torque bow. Here is the bow on this. Okay, that kind of wraps all of this up. These two commandments are, are unfulfillable if you don't have either of them. Or, how should I say, if you're not fulfilling one, you cannot be fulfilling the other. By default. Think of it this way. If you love God and you hate every single person... You want to like destroy them and send them all to hell, but you only think you're going to heaven? That's not loving your neighbor. That's absolutely not. That's not doing anything good, really. You can love God all you want, but you gotta, you got to share that. Tell people about it. Be good to other people. His creation, as it were. And if you don't love God... And, but you love all of his creation, then you're not guiding them to God. You're not bringing them there. I, I've never made this like explicitly public, and but I'll say it here. And this isn't anything you know, explicitly biblical. But this is something that I hope because I, I truly don't have a single glimmer of hatred towards anything or anybody, ever. I hope when I, if I get to heaven, I see everybody there. Even people I have never met. I hope I see my family there. I hope I see my mom there. I hope I see... My next door neighbor when I was eight. I hope I see them there too. I hope I see the guy I saw at Walmart six months ago. I hope I see the dude that ran the red light a year ago that I yelled at in heaven. I hope I see every single person. I hope. Because I believe this agape love not only extends to Jesus' ministry on earth when he was here. It extends all the time. Unconditional, sacrificial, and completely irregardless of anything. I think about this dialogue a lot. Jesus very, very knowingly calls it I mean he says it right there there is none other commandment greater than these so that means that means if you think oh they don't read this type of bible or something oh they don't go to church enough They don't do this enough, or they don't pray as much as I want them to. <laughs> Think back to these sets of verses. These commandments here. Love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and strength. And love your neighbor <laughs> as yourself. And now I just, I pass it off. Do we do this every day? I'm unsure. Like I said earlier, there are people on the internet that are just being gross and mean. I'm sure there are people in real life that are gross and mean too. 
that are unreasonable, that are not compassionate in any way, that don't have that aristocratic spirituality in them that wants to share it with everybody else. Just wants to keep it to themselves. Oh, they'll, God will take care of them. They'll see. They'll get what's coming to them. <laughs> no. That's not how we should be thinking. We should be with these people. Christ, Christ leader or not, we should be with them. We should commune with them, be friends with them, be good to them. They are a, just, they're, say what you will, but there are some lovely people out there that I, I hope are saved. That I hope I will see in heaven. This is a very long devotional. <laughs> but again, let me finalize it here. Love God and love your neighbor all the time. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor unconditionally. Love your neighbor sacrificially. With that agape love that is reasonable, compassionate, and aristocratically spiritual. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. really intense devotional today. This is something I've been wanting to talk about for so long, and I'm finally glad that I got a, a verse set that I can finally dive into it with. Deeply, too. But, alright, let's go to Lord in prayer here. Dear Lord, first off, thank you for your love. <laughs> thank you for all you do, really. a lot of things you do on this earth that either I can recognize or I, I can't even see and it's all done in love Lord I have a girlfriend that I love very very much I have a family that I love very very much And I have a world that you created that I love very, very much, Lord. I want to see everybody turn towards you. I want to bask in your glory, Lord. Show them how great your grace and mercy is. And I know it's all up to you, Lord. You are sovereign. You are truly the ultimate, the end all, be all. With your agape love, with your whole love, with everything. And I pray deeply that we can share that love with everybody. Reasonably, compassionately, and fully spiritually. I pray you look over me and my family here, Lord, and my girlfriend and her family, and all of the extended families out from them, Lord, and over the entire world. I know you have our best interest at heart. I thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you all for joining me for today's daily devotional. I, I appreciate it. I know this is another super duper long one. These are getting very, um, <laughs> dare I say, <laughs> ministerial in how I approach them now. Where I have kind of like a, a lesson or something that I kind of want to expound on in these verses. 
I typically, so like with today, I have a like kind of like a bulleted script. I typically have like a script that I go over and I jump into, but I'm thinking about making them a little bit more in depth, a little bit more involved scriptly where I can have like a script that I start with go into like something like a sermon or something, something a little bit longer, a little bit more in depth. I don't know, but something that I've been thinking about, but if you're here with me and you watched the entire thing, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I will be, of course, seeing you in the next Daily Devotional. And again, sorry for how, how late this one came, but I appreciate you being here with me. Um, thank you so much. I'll see you in tomorrow's Daily Devotional. Thank you. God bless.